Okay, so I'm just going to start talking. So this is going to be the start of what is going to be four theme sessions that will carry over for the next few days. And the way uh, they will work is we'll have a series of uh, presentations followed by a short uh, question and answer period. And then at the end of each theme session, we'll have a, a panel discussion where all of the presenters will come up here and we'll have the opportunity for people to pose questions for the group. So I'm going to introduce the moderator for the first session, uh, which is Phil Levin from the Northwest Fisheries Science Center. Why are you clapping? Uh, okay, so I'm, I'm Phil, and uh, so just to be clear for everybody, uh, this you're supposed to end at 25 minutes, and then I stand up and look annoyed. Um, and then there will be time for a couple questions, but afterwards there's a panel discussion, so we can follow up on, on questions that we don't have time for after the speakers at, at that point. Okay. So uh, you probably figured out our first speaker already is Ann Holloway, who is a senior scientist at the Alaska Fisheries Science Center, and. Uh, my colleague at, at, at NOAA Fisheries, um, where um, I just heard that science is back. Uh, and uh, I didn't know it left, which is, which is the weird thing. Um, so, um, and the title of her talk is An Assessment of Fisheries Management Strategies in Alaska Relative to the Goals of Ecosystem Approaches. Okay, well, uh, before I begin, I, should, I want to acknowledge my co-authors, and you'll see uh, several pre slides that were contributed by people other than myself. Uh, Kira Maiden provided some, Jennifer Bolt, Angie Grieg, Pat Livingston, and Chang Jang, all have been uh, major contributors to this presentation. And Pat Livingston, of course, sends her apologies. She's on her way back from China. She'll be here later this afternoon or tomorrow. Um, a lot of this is uh, on behalf of, I'm speaking on behalf of Pat. So let's see if I can get this to go. Okay, so um, Andre said that uh, we didn't want lists, but I thought I should at least give you an idea of, of some of the things that, that I'll be speaking about. And my first uh, effort will be to give an overview of how the Alaska Fisheries Science Center and the region have attempted to implement e ecosystem-based management in fisheries off of Alaska. Uh, then I'll give you some examples on how we're assessing our performance relative to those, those goals and objectives. And uh, those will be a variety of of pieces, I'll give you some examples of our status report and ecosystem indicators. Some of the, I'll give an overview of the modeling efforts uh, to predict the future impacts, and that's really going to be an overview. With 30 minutes, I can't get into the details of any one. But then I'm going to, in, in the spirit of what uh, Jake was mentioning, talk about an integrative tool that I've been working on with Jane, Jane uh, that will look at the uh, tracking the progress in a framework tool, and then um, we'll have some concluding comments after that. So uh, here is our list, uh, as Andre mentioned and Jake mentioned, uh, these goals uh, have been promoted throughout the world. Uh, the, these came out of a major environmental impact analysis that was done in 2003, I think it was, a programmatic EIS where we, the council at, uh, dealt with what are our overarching policies for management in Alaska. And they came up with this list. Uh, they are your standard character, cast of characters, prevent overfishing, promote sustainable fisheries and communities, preserve the food web, manage incidental catch and reduce bycatch and waste, avoid impacts to seabirds and marine mammals, and reduce and avoid, avoid impacts to habitat. 
There were also three others that promote equitable and efficient use of fisheries use or resources and increase Alaska Native consultation and data quality and monitoring and enforcement. And really, th those issues are more on the policy and regulatory side of the house, and, and I won't talk much about those. But I will try and give you some examples of how we in Alaska are trying to measure our performance relative to the standards you see here in the blue. Uh, it's often been said that, that because Alaska has a quota system that, and it's, uh, those quotas are set species by species that we're still doing the old fashioned single species management. And I hope by the end of my talk that you realize that's really not the case in Alaska. It is a multi-species, multi-fishery, multi-sector, multi-objective management system. Um, the, to the surface that, uh, of the available acceptable total catch is constrained considerably by many different objectives, not only the single species harvest catch. For example, there are prohibited species bycatch caps on some of the major fisheries like halibut, crab, salmon, and herring. There are ecosystem considerations that up until in the last few years had only been reported, but in the last few years they actually have been part of the decision-making uh, uh, process in some of our, our uh, pollock fisheries in, in, in the Bering Sea. There are habitat pr protection provisions that mostly take the form of area closures and that sort of thing. And there are a variety of other pieces, uh, particularly in, in how the fishery is provisioned between the sectors now that it is rationalized. And there, the rationalization is primarily through cooperatives rather than ITQs, that one exception being Sable Fish. So if we go through how, what some of those, and this series of slides will show you how some of these regulations are in place. In terms of our harvest strategy, it is pretty conservative. Um, we, we have a harvest control rule with a limit and a, a target. Uh, when you get below a threshold, just very similar to what uh, Jake showed you, you, you begin reducing uh, fishing mortality. This is F on this axis and this is B on this axis. There actually is, is a cutoff here for some of the major forage fish species like pollock and cod and acromacro, where we cut, cut off fishing altogether, uh, directed fishing even earlier. And so you can see that this is a pretty conservative approach itself. The, the other piece that's maybe not immediately um, recognized by everyone is that we use the lowest common denominator. And in Alaska, we have an excellent observer system so they can, in real time, track the catch of all of the species that they're managing. And if it looks like we're going to exceed the limit of any one, then you shut down the fisheries that are likely to have a high bycatch of that species, as well as the target fishery for it itself. So these are, are, are examples of how uh, the constraints uh, would play out in, in Alaska. Uh, and, the, and then, of course, this OFL is a, a really a, a, a hard cap. It, we uh, shut the fisheries down to avoid exceeding the OF, OFL. This is an example of some of the habitat closures. Some of these are not complete closures in that some <coughs> gear types are allowed. For example, this is a no-trawl area off of southeast Alaska. This is a no-trawl area in Bristol Bay. But you can see there are a variety of habitat protection areas or, or gear interaction areas that have been set aside in Alaska. We uh, performed a major uh, review of our habitat issues uh, through when the legislation brought forward for the essential fish habitat legislation in the US. And in response to that, we made some additional adjustments to the habitat closures. The largest one that happened almost immediately with the EFH analysis was to close, freeze the footprint in Alaska where we've closed the deep sea areas and the only remaining areas are these green areas where they have historically been fishing. So a considerable amount of the Aleutian Islands now is protected from fishing. Uh, 
subsequently, we have also frozen the deep offshore areas in the, off of the Bering Sea shelf. <coughs> And there is the Northern Bering Sea Research Area, and this area is currently closed, but there, there are opportunities to propose research that would allow this area to be open to limited fishing, fishing after the uh, experiments have been done to truly understand the impact of those proposed fisheries. So in terms of, I mentioned prohibited species caps. These are uh, primarily to prevent a bycatch of fisheries that are managed by other groups. So the Halibut Commission ha uh, deals with halibut. Of course, state and federal agencies deal with salmon. Uh, crab is handled by a separate f and uh, in Alaska. And herring fisheries are primarily managed by, by the uh, state fisheries in Alaska. <coughs> and so the, the, in order to handle those, we have prohibited species by catch caps. And in particular, the, the uh, halibut cap is a major constraint to the development of our flatfish fisheries. And so there's a considerable amount of flatfish that is left on the ground be, as it hits the halibut caps. Uh, we, we have recently gone through a major review. This is a chum, but we finished our Chinook and chum are up next um, to look at bycatch of salmon in the pollock fisheries in, in the Bering Sea. Uh, some of the pieces that came out of that was to create a hard cap with an incentive program run by the cooperatives that would be uh, an incentive to try and re keep bycatch low. And so those will be operated by the um, co-ops themselves. Uh, and so you can see that these are examples of additional constraints that are imposed upon the fishery itself. To date, herring hasn't been a big constraint, though we do keep track of it. Uh, there's been growing recognition in Alaska not only to protect prohibited species, but there may be some, Jake talked about vulnerable species. And these are <coughs> the ones that are of immediate concern in Alaska are those that are in what we call our other species complex. And that includes sharks, squids, skates, sculpins, and I don't have, I couldn't find a picture before the talk of octopus. And so these are species that are currently, or at least historically, have been managed all as one complex. Now we're in the effort of breaking those out into their separate partitions. And as Jake said, uh, it's really tempting to, to, to use uh, the tools that we have at hand. And so we're doing that by looking at the susceptibility of these species to fishing. So what's the bycatch? <coughs> And what's, what are their vital rates? So how does that bycatch relate to uh, its particular vulnerability? In this case, mostly its natural mortality rate. This has spurred a considerable amount of research on the, on the vital rates for the, all of these species. The one caveat I would have to, to Jake's recommendation is that it's not completely easy. It's pretty good for sculpin, where our trawl fisheries catch sculpins and we don't have much trouble with that, or it's likewise with skates. The difficulty comes when, it, for example, with shark, species identification is great. The observer knows when a shark hits the surface. It isn't a big mystery. The problem is, what's the biomass? And we really don't have good assessments of what is the biomass of shark. On the other side, with sculpins, you may find that you have good biomass but getting the observer, there are about 30 species of sculpins, so getting the observers trained to identify each of those down to species is pretty challenging. So even though we have vital rates and productivity, you still need to catch a biomass in order to get moving. Uh, the basic idea, though, is that these, as we break those out, we would begin to move in um, the avenue of setting quotas for these. Uh, there is. Also a consideration of forage fish. And here, the council's using a catch deterrent system rather than a quota system. And that is done by what we call a maximum retention allowance. So we don't allow a directed fishery, and then we try and keep the bycatch of the forage species. And in this case, it's euphausids and, and many of the um, capelin uh, 
sand lance, uh, uacon, that sort of thing, major species that represent the forage base in Alaska. There's a 2% retention allowance on the landed catch, and so you try and, and uh, keep the, the capture of these species low through that mechanism. Uh, the last piece is there's a major effort to reduce discard, and the major piece that has happened is, is the uh, avenue of full re uh, requirement of full retention on the cod and pollock vessels. This is also now being implemented for some of our flatfish vessels as well. And so uh, we're, we're definitely moving in the way of reducing waste and reducing discards in, in that avenue. Uh, it's not only through ground fish retention standards, but it's also through bycatch avoidance. And so the idea, this is primarily with halibut and salmon, is trying to find ways to design nets that would avoid the capture of either halibut or salmon uh, so that you don't bring them on board in the first place, that you release them in the ocean. So uh, now I'm gonna shift to our, our current methods of looking at how we evaluate where we are. Uh, this is primarily done uh, with a retrospective look at where we are relative to some of those goals and objectives that I indicated earlier. And so this slide has to do with whether or not we are looking <coughs> at um, how we're doing in terms of sustainability. Oops, sorry. Uh, and you can see here that on an annual basis we report these are the, the um, target and limit reference points. So this would be your target. And you can see most of our stocks, this is really where you want to be. There are a couple stocks that have fallen below their MSY or, or, or proxies for MSY. Those most, in, uh, you've seen the news, uh, Bering Sea Pollock is now slightly below its MSY. But it's still above its limit in terms of uh, and MSST, and none of our stocks are we allowing overfishing to take place. Uh, in terms of catch reporting, we also not only report on these, but we also report on uh, time trends in, in the capture of non-targets, as well as prohibited species, seabird bycatch, uh, and non-specified species and forage fish. And you'll see, these are all reported in our uh, ecosystem considerations chapter, and I'll give you a slide of that. In addition, on a five-year time step, we review the, our performance relative to the goals and objectives set out for, for a central fish habitat. And these are all produced in reports, and more often than not, those, are, those types of reports are, are peer-reviewed in the case of our stock assessments by either the Center of Independent Experts and now some of our stocks are going undergoing review by the Marine Stewardship Council. And so the, and, and when we do do major pieces like the essential fish habitat, that is also peer reviewed through the Center of Independent Experts. So this gives you an idea of, and you're gonna see, this is just an introduction to, I have two slides showing this type of analysis. This is in the ecosystem considerations chapter that's funded by the FATE program and the Resource Ecology and Ecosystem Modeling Program within the Alaska Fishing Science Center. And Karen Maiden runs that. And Jennifer Bolt is the main fake PI on this. Uh, this gives you, this is a way that they have put together to actually summarize the uh, variety of ecosystem indicators so that you don't only get the red light, green light idea, but you actually get some analysis of the time trend with it. Uh, just to, to let you understand this, this is plus, plus or minus one standard deviation of the time trend that you have. Uh, then what you're looking at is the performance in the last part of, part of the time series. And so for the last five years, you're looking at whether or not uh, it's significantly different from the mean. And as you can see, this particular one was declining, but it actually uh, isn't significantly away from the mean. And then what is the trend in the last five years? And that gives you this one. So you can at a glance kind of get the overall time series, where it is relative to the long-term mean, and what direction it's going in the, la in the most recent period. And then these X's have to deal with whether or not you had enough data to do, look at it over the last five years. So 
Here are some examples of the integrated pieces I showed you earlier, well, how we stood in terms of the single species harvest, whether we were overfishing or not. These give you some sort of integrated indices like, oops, sorry, the diversity index, the species richness index, the size spectrum of the uh, uh, slope, uh, where we are relative to Hatsi, uh, and, and looking at both the Bering Sea and the Aleutian Islands. Uh, and then, of course, looking, these are Bering Sea, these are Gulf of Alaska. And you can see whether or not your trend is is downward or stable. And you can see for many of these, like the diversity index, things have been pretty stable. For some of the indices in the Gulf, we don't, because we don't have surveys every year, you, you, you don't necessarily get enough data to make a trend analysis in the last part of the time series. They don't only look at, at integrated pieces like the um, uh, uh, diversity indices, but they also look at, as I mentioned, the t performance of the fishery itself. So you can see what's the total catch doing, what's the bottom trawl effort doing, long line effort, uh, the mean trophic level of the catch, uh, the fishery imbalance index, the, the discard rates, these sorts of things. So this gives you a way of one, on one page to look at, at, the, at a variety of information. The other piece that's going on within the center is, a, is an effort to actually move from the index analysis that I just showed you to actually have, developing some forecasting tools. And the main tools that we're looking at are multi-species bycatch models, uh, multi-species 